Stay tuned. Bridges starts now. Hi, I want to welcome you to Bridges today. I'm Monica Schmelter. I'm so glad that you could join us. And my guest today is an author. And Jay, I want to welcome you to the program. Thanks for having me. Now, Jay, when I looked at this book, I'm going to try to say this title because I thought, how, how do I memorize this? Sure. Is it Road Trip Mixtapes? Yes, that's correct. Vegas, Red Bull, and Faith on a Detour. That is correct, yeah. That's awesome. Tell me about this book. Sure. Uh, I, I wrote it, um, I started on it a little over three years ago. So it took six months to write it and two and a half years to edit it into something readable, <laughs> um, which is a, a brand new process for me. It's my first book. I, mm -hmm. I had never really thought of myself as an author. I had been blogging for years. And uh, through some really personal difficulties, I was kind of blogging my way through those. Mm -hmm. had a lot of questions about faith and, and culture and life. and. And uh, at the end of a, a season of blogging, um, we ended up with kind of the first draft, 160 pages of just, you know, words on pages. Yeah. I, and I read that you didn't really consider yourself an author, but this was just kind of something that came about to you through as you were talking about working through personal difficulties. What are some of the topics that you approach in the book? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, some of it is my own insecurities. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've dealt with social anxiety um, and, and depression on and off for most of my adult life. And so some of it's just tr trying to take a lighthearted but, but serious approach to that and, and being vulnerable and just talking about it. Sometimes I think we're so afraid, especially in the church, um, to, to be honest with some of that stuff. The truth is there are a lot of people in the church who have social anxiety, a lot of people who struggle with depression. And if, if you can't talk about it, you know, sometimes somebody has to take the first step. And, and so I felt like for me, with at least my friends, my peers, you know, the people I was blogging to, mm -hmm. I thought maybe if I could be honest with some of that stuff, uh, that it could start a chain reaction. Right. And I'm sure that one of the things that you probably found, Jay, is that a lot more people are struggling with the same things that you're struggling with than maybe what you thought initially. Yeah, I think one of the one of the biggest lies that we deal with internally uh, is that we're alone and that nobody feels like we feel nobody mm -hmm. struggles with our secret struggles right and and this is why men in the church struggle so hard with um, with pornography and some of that other stuff and it's why uh, there's infidelity because the biggest lie is nobody feels how I feel Absolutely. so instead of being able to talk about it with a community or a friend or, or a leader we keep it inside so that we can sort of keep up that public front and, uh, and I, I wanted to challenge that mentality a little bit. Yeah, because I think that keeping it all inside is one of the biggest lies and I think that one of the next biggest lies is that you know even if somebody doesn't feel what I feel it doesn't mean that they can't understand or be empathic or that we can't have a relationship. I think that we think that what we feel is so isolated to us and then it's so unique that people yeah. would not accept or embrace us if they knew we were struggling you know with social anxiety or with depression when in fact I think most human beings on planet earth have. Right. Yeah, one of the things I tell people all the time when, when I'm having one-on-one -on -one conversations, especially with people saying, I just don't feel like anybody gets me, and I don't have any relationships mm -hmm. in the church, and I feel so isolated, I say, I, I challenge them, because this is something that I've had to do as an introvert and as somebody who recharges with alone time. <laughs> uh, I love people, but I, I need alone time to yeah. recharge. But I say, you know, become the community that you desire inside. Amen. And so if you want vulnerability, be a vulnerable person. Mm -hmm. If you want intentional relationships, be intentional with yes. your relationships. Because I think as I share part of my backstory with you and we're having coffee and I, I get real honest, usually something gets triggered and you go, oh my gosh, I, the same thing happened to me. Exactly. When, you know, And now we're connecting on a deeper level than just, so what do you do for a living? I mean, that's great, yeah. but it's only a start. <laughs> that's right, it is just a starting place. Because yeah. if we stay there, I find Jay, at least for me anyway, that's a really lonely place. Yeah. Well, you know, here's what I do for a living and gosh, here's what I did last week. Uh, you know, but I'm not really talking about me or how Monica thinks or how I feel or what I might be concerned about. And I think what, what you're trying to get to in the book is to challenge people to have relationships and community instead of waiting for somebody else to start. Yeah. Us be the brave ones and start. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been at a party and have this scenario happen, but you walk in and you're sort of meeting people and, and you're so concerned about getting your own name right that you don't even remember their name. Absolutely. Right? And so then you spent a whole evening with people that you vaguely remember. <laughs> uh, and I, I, 
and I got tired of that being my story. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, maybe I can't meet everybody, but if I can have a good conversation with one person and actually have a, a really relational exchange, mm -hmm. then maybe they can better my life and I can better their life and there can be, you know, yeah. a differentiation. Yeah, and I think that what you're talking about right there demands that we be intentional Absolutely. because that kind of stuff doesn't just happen like the stuff that just happens is hi Jay this is what I do for a living right, right. here's what I did last week and next week this is what I'm gonna do yeah well, we said a lot of stuff yeah we said a lot of stuff but we didn't exchange anything yeah yeah Absolutely. and do you think specifically that that's something that's missing in the church in every age group is really that inability or just fear of sharing who we are the time that that became the most apparent to me was right after I finished college. Mm -hmm. In college, I had a great community, right? Because you have a concentration of a bunch of people. Yeah. And uh, even if you go to a, a mainstream university, not a Christian university, there's still usually uh, an on-campus yeah. group of, of believers. And so mm -hmm. you're around a ton of people who are your age who have similar ideals or are at least figuring out what their ideals yeah. are. Um, and it's really, really easy to build mm -hmm. community in that environment for the most part. Yeah. I mean, again, there are still people who, who struggle with that. Uh, but then coming out of that into the adult world yeah. <laughs> and to the corporate world where your your day is consumed with your nine to five and then you know you have a few hours afterwards and that's it um, that becomes really difficult yes, it does. and so from that you know from the ages of really 21 22 uh, and into your 30s and 40s it's really really hard and then I feel like as some of my friends have kids they begin to find a new community again yeah. with other parents mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you're sort of forced into right. these relationships. Right, exactly. Uh, but there's this gaping hole, you know, for all of your 20s that um, it can be really, really hard to build relationships. Yeah, because it's not like what's right in front of you. Right. So when you're talking about like in high school and in college, you've got that right in front of you. Absolutely. But then in 20s and 30s, especially if you're single, yeah. It's not right in front of you. You have to make that happen. And I learned like on the other side, then after 30s and 40s, and then like your kids grow up, then those aren't your, it's not your automatic community, other parents. Yeah. So then I had like had to figure out after that, like as an empty nester, okay, well then how does that happen? How do you uh, have community? Because it used to be on kids' play dates and your kid goes to school here and my kid is over here. And I think that God wants us to be intentional. He values relationships. And I think that that's a way, not that it solves all of our depression or social anxiety, but it does help us Absolutely. through those things to have these relationships. Now, as I kind of looked into your book, I, I was intrigued that the first uh, chapter name was Cosmic Santa Jesus. What does that mean? <laughs> sure. Uh, Cosmic Sin of Jesus is just a way to sort of lightheartedly tease at the prayer mentality that I had uh, mm -hmm. for a long season of my, of my faith journey. Um, I think growing up, what sort of subtly snuck into my faith consciousness mm -hmm. was this idea, right, we hear it all the time, and, and, and it sort of builds, no one ever come out and say it directly, but it builds this idea of, self-centered Christianity, yeah. right? It's your personal walk with Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's your personal relationship. It's just me and him. And there are moments where that's really important. Oh, yeah. But what happens is then you pray that way. Dear Lord, give me what I want so that I can be happy. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm exaggerating <laughs> it, but we would say it in a much more flowery way. Lord, please help me pay my bills and get me a bigger house and a better job mm -hmm. and, and help my kids to be safe and whatever. Yeah. Um, and again, I think that there are parts of that that are okay, and I'm not trying sure. to crash people's prayer life. Mm -hmm. But for me, what I, I felt is, you know what, when Jesus teaches us how to pray, the first two words are our and father. Our, which is a sense of community, Amen. and father, which is a sense of family. And mm -hmm. so what I realized for me is I was missing out on an element of prayer that built in community and family. Yeah. Um, that we're actually all in this together. And so it's really much more expedient for me to be aware of what's going on in your life so that I can pray with you. Not That's just right. I'll pray for you, but mm -hmm. let me pray, let me stand with you yes. in what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm. And you know what's going on. So it requires more than just this. Right. And, but not only does it require more, God in his infinite wisdom gives us more back Absolutely. as a result. Because there's something, you know, I know that you that are watching that just gets incredibly frustrating when our prayer life is, dear God, I need a bigger house and a fireplace and I need this and it's okay to pray for a house. I'm not saying that, but right. when we stop there, 
when that becomes the object of our Christianity, I know for myself, Jay, that's when I get messed up. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really easy to get off track. Or when we do pray globally, it's, it's very vague because we're not connected. Yeah. You know, I pray for the kids in X country. That's so that, right. And that's, again, those are all great starts. They are. But I think that there are deeper places that we can go as we tie ourselves into the stories of other people. Mm -hmm. and, and that's dangerous, being vulnerable is difficult and sometimes it backfires. It doesn't yeah. always work out. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where grace plays in. I need to give people grace when they let that's me down. Right. And, and I need to receive grace when I let them down. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I think we get this in a family structure, right? Like yeah. we always say that like, <laughs> my kids are my kids. I might not always like them, but that's I'll always right. love them. Amen. And we mm -hmm. get that in, mm -hmm. in our actual bloodline family. Mm -hmm. But I think we forget about that we do. In, in the church world a little bit. We do. And you know, I've had to remind myself sometimes, Jay, like when I get afraid to be vulnerable or to risk because I'm going to get hurt. You know, when you get the time that you do get hurt, you're like, oh, see, I, I know I shouldn't have done that. Right. But like I have to remind myself that really, I need to expect that because I mess up. So I need to give grace that other people in my life are also going to mess up. Yeah. And to give myself and God some credit that I can handle it. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to fall apart because this happens. This is what happens in life. But that God gives us the grace, you know, to walk through it yeah. and to handle it. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're the body of Christ, right? And so. Uh, if my arm gets broken, yeah. I don't just like let the arm go because it failed me and it's not doing its job anymore. I, I nurture it and care for it with the rest of my body Amen. so that it can be restored mm -hmm. and brought back to its full potential. Right. And your whole body is working toward that goal. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and it's like yeah. that we've got to get that picture that that's what we're working toward and, and praying and walking forth. Well, I want to thank you for coming today. Absolutely. And for sharing your book. We'll give you more information about this on our website, and we'll be back with more in just a moment. Prayer changes things. If you need prayer, write to the address on the screen. Call 615-754-0039 or email prayer at ctntv.org. For more information on a guest, visit our website, ctntv.org. The work of Christ in our lives is not just a surface work. It goes deep down into the core of who we are. And the joy that God, that Christ wants to produce in our lives is a joy that is of substance. To schedule Monica to speak at your next event, contact her at monicaspeaks.com. If you're just joining us today on Bridges, we've been talking about travel and living the comfortable life. And today you're gonna to get to meet the father of a family who says that when they gave up the comfortable life for what God had for them, they found themselves at a place feeling totally fulfilled. Joey Langford, I wanna welcome you to Bridges today. Thank you, it's good to be here this morning. Now when I heard a little bit about your story about how you were really you and your family living the American dream, mm. the wonderful Christian life, and then you sold your business to move to Africa. Of all places. I thought, what in the world? <laughs> Yeah, it was, I think we felt the same way. Yeah, you I know, think you know, when, did. when uh, we, we were, uh, both my wife and I born and raised in Middle Tennessee and um, had uh, lived uh, a, a normal uh, life by, by social standards mm -hmm. here, grew up in Christian homes, um, was raised in a, in a Baptist church. Um, I, I really was in church every time the door was open, and yeah. I know there are a lot of people around who can identify with that, <laughs> that upbringing, but... Um, and then um, after uh, uh, college, I left college uh, about halfway through a, a major, um, had a relationship failure, a breakdown with a girlfriend, so I left college and moved back from Texas to Tennessee where I started working in a uh, hospital equipment company that was owned by my father, so it's a family owned business. And um, when I got into that, I remember really enjoying the business aspect of that and was there for 10 years growing that until um, we covered about two thirds of the state of Tennessee and I was running the business. Um, and then that, that uh, 2008 uh, time frame, I went to and accepted the invitation to go on a short term mission trip. And, um, 
I came had back. Had you ever gone on a mission trip I had before? never gone on a Sorry. mission trip, you know, and, and I, 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 my wife and I used to juggle those, uh, those uh, mailers that would come in from people <laughs> asking me for $50 or $100 so they could go. And I think at times I'd be like, you know, I mean, good gracious, how many people are going to go see the world? <laughs> I understand. You know, um, but uh, I remember my brother came to me and said, we got to go to Nicaragua and build a uh, orphan house mm -hmm. there. We got a, a, a lot of cool guys going, uh, some, some fr mutual friends. So I felt like, yeah, I mean, this is a great time for me to go and, and see something different. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did see something different. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw something that I'd never um, saw, uh, uh, much less experienced the way that I experienced it in that third world kind of poverty right. vibe that because was there. It, it sounds like from what you've described to me that prior to that missions trip, short-term yes. missions trip, you had really lived the American dream. You were excelling at it. And if there was a checklist, like you were doing I, it, you know, I go to church, I tithe, I live a good life, sure. I'm a businessman, I love my wife, I love my kids, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things. Nothing, nothing. But at 30 years old, I had achieved that. Yeah. You know, we had the big house, 5,000 square foot house on the property. I was buying a new car, a new truck every couple of years. I had the barn full of the... Yeah. Horses and the, and the 83 vintage Jeep and the, and the four wheeler and, and the Harley Davidson motorcycle. And so. And were you fulfilled I, by I, those things? No, 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 no. no. That, I think looking back on that, that every six months, uh, if I look at, if, if, if I look back at how my life was sort of progressing, I see that about every six months I tended to buy something else. Yeah. You know, it was like that next big mm -hmm. thing, that next whatever I needed to put into that hole to, to get me by, to make me feel like, okay, I can. And then I think as, after I came back from the mission trip that we were talking about, I, I, I felt those feelings of it, even, they became more real. They became more frequent. It began to be less about six months and then maybe like all the time. I was living in this place, what, wait, something got to be different. I mean, I, I don't know what that is. I didn't even know how to have a conversation with my wife about it. Um, I Were just, you like feeling a pull to do missions? It or? wasn't missions at the time. Uh -huh. It was just a discontentment with and looking at life and thinking, wait. Um, I, and I believe that the devil really turned that into shame and guilt at first. Mm -hmm. Like, look at all you've got. How can you not be? <laughs> I mean, right. you're just you, you the need most to be ungrateful thankful. person on the planet. Yeah, yeah. you I need mean, to be thankful, Joey. your dad's giving you this opportunity. Yeah. You, don't have, you don't have any job security issues. Your, your salary's not going to be cut. You know, you make a, a great living. And you just need to work harder. Mm -hmm. And I think that's began to be what it was. I just started working harder and staying later and trying to outrun or run out from under those feelings that I felt. Right. And... Um, it didn't happen. Hmm. It couldn't happen. I, I, I really believe um, as 2008 progressed, uh, we went into the same Christmas season that we always go in. And I remember sp spending quite a bit of money on our children again. We had three at the time. And um, going into that January post-holiday season and hitting that slump again, like, you know, my kids, the toys that we bought two weeks early were already in the garage. <laughs> Yeah. And they were asking to go to Walmart, mm -hmm. and and it was this revelation of wait, they're you know they're just following you. I mean, look at the pattern of life exactly. that has developed <laughs> in your life. You know, don't don't look at Braxton as ungrateful. More do a life assessment of where you are, and look exactly. in your barn and all the things that you've bought over this last year that you're not going to touch mm -hmm. for another year. Because for a lot of us as parents, that's what we're teaching our children. More stuff, more stuff. This is what's going to make you happy. When you get this next big thing, then everything is going to be good. And so you're seeing that in your children, and you're having this pull. Yes, at that, the same that time. That there's something more. Like you've got everything, but right. yet you really are half empty. And, you, and I would look at Braxton, my second yeah. child, and I, and I would say to him, you just need to be happy. Ah. I mean, look, your mom doesn't have to go to work. <laughs> You get to stay home. Mm -hmm. You go everywhere. You, you you do everything. You have everything you want. Mm -hmm. Why aren't you happy? Mm -hmm. And then as I began to peel the layers off of that in my own personal life, I realized, wait, he's modeling his dad. Mm -hmm. His dad's not happy. What? What's missing? Yeah. 
what am I missing? And I did begin to talk to my wife, and a lot of it was motivated out of frustration at the beginning. And, you know, I tell people she could have re reacted one of two ways. She could have said, you're crazier than a headshot house cat. Yeah. I'm not having any of that. And I would think as a I, man you'd have to be kind of afraid, I, like, where's this conversation going? I, exactly. I mean, you know, you need to be working, and we need to be doing this. This is our life. Yeah, this it'd be normal. frightening. Yeah, this is what everybody Everybody's wants. Everybody's doing this. Yeah. Um, and she did she looked at me, I'll never forget, when I came out of the barn um, and, and the experience that happened right there in January of 2009. I went to my barn on my property on a Friday afternoon at 3.30. I came home from work, and I remember just being um, ready to get away. <laughs> um, walked in the house and said, babe, I'm just going to go down to the barn. And my barn was... Uh, that place where I feel most comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I was, uh, there's a wood stove in there, the hay, the horses could stick their heads in. And I remember taking my Bible and my journal. Um, again, I didn't go to the barn anticipating a spiritual revelation of sorts or that, you know, I, I just had never been there in my spiritual life. But, uh, but, but Friday night turned into Saturday. And, and Saturday turned into Saturday night. And my wife, would holler from the house, are you coming up? No, I'm not coming up yet. Saturday night, God showed up there in that barn. And um, I began to see some things. I began to see my life through a different lens. <laughs> it was this collision of here's reality. Here's what you're doing. And I do have plans for you. <laughs> you know, um, Jeremiah 29, 11. And I began to really wrestle with that. Um, and, and come through, I think, in the wee hours of Saturday morning realizing that the reason I was where I was is because I had centered life completely around me. <laughs> Everything, my natural heart bend in my flesh was to myself, and I was just feeding that. And uh, if I would get down off the throne of my life, God was would get there on that throne and he would take me into those plans that he had for me. Yeah, and really, even in this book that you've written, Fulfilled, that's really kind of the the brunt of it or the crux of it mm. is about that being surrendered mm -hmm. to God, to what his plans are. And for all of us, right. that that's the only way to really be fulfilled. Because what you're describing, even though you made a big salary, mm -hmm. you know, there are lots of people watching right now that, you know, your salary might be 30 grand or 40 grand or 20 grand, but you're experiencing the same things that Joey's talking mm -hmm. about. Because all of us, when our lives are centered on us and meeting our own needs, it's never enough. That's the whole deception of it. Right. I think fulfillment um, is not an economic. No or a destination thing. You know, what I don't want people to hear from our story is is surrender Africa. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then book and then whatever else. Exactly. It's, that's that's not it. I, I pray that people really hear that um, fulfillment is awaiting everybody. Amen. The poorest in Africa, the richest in America, on the other side of absolute and total surrender to God. Yeah. That's his condition. Amen. And I didn't see that. I, I, I wanted it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people want it. I mean, look around. I, 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 I get the opportunity and, and I'm blessed to be able to come back to my home in, in Tennessee six weeks a year. And my wife and I have been away now four years almost. And, I, and, and we're amazed that when we come back that people are almost, almost seem to be screaming how did you do this? Exactly. We, we, we want to know how to, how to get there. And, and that prescription, that prescribed method of getting to God is, is uh, between Genesis and Revelations. Yeah. And I find that, you know, the more that I say, I, I really, I'm not, don't hear this story as, you know, a, a switch flipped, surrender, and then everyday hunky-dory. That's right. We're going on in life and ministry. That's more, right. More hear somebody that's, that's, um, that's still struggling. You know, because, has to put the post-it note in his wind in his mm -hmm. mirror where he brushes his teeth to remind him every day that surrender is a daily process. That's right, and it's different for all of us. Every, every you know, single person. Because you were talking about from Genesis to Revelation, like following God or surrender, surrendering to him is not a formula. You don't mm -hmm. sell your house and then go move to Africa because that's what Joey Langford <laughs> did and now his family is fulfilled because that's what God had for the Langfords. Right. 
But for all of us, there is a place of 100% of surrender, although I'm still surrendering every Amen. moment of Amen. every day. And then I mess up and then I have to go back Amen. and lay it down again. And that's what you're trying to, to paint for people right. is that we can all be fulfilled at whatever point of surrender God has for us. Yes, wherever that is. Exactly. Now, I know that you've journaled a lot of your story in your book, and we'll give your website so that people can watch that, because we've got just a couple minutes left. But tell me about your kids and your family okay. and how, how it is for, for you all in Africa, being uh, missionaries. The number one question I get is, is uh, okay, so tell me how your wife and kids are. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, they couldn't be better. Mm -hmm. I, I believe when I stepped into, now, now looking back over this, um, and, and when I quit trying to manipulate and manage my family into a place where I thought they should be and started leading them under the direction of the Holy Spirit. I watched them grow into uh, the, the confirmations I remember early, uh, earliest in this surrender journey was seeing my wife grow into things that I never imagined she could mm -hmm. do. Um, spiritually, just by being released. Um, Africa has been a, an amazing experience for our family. My kids have a, a worldview that allows them to now sit in the poorest township um, with people and, and, and feel comfortable and also go into some of the wealthiest homes and sit at the tables and feel comfortable. So um, I, I look forward to seeing how God uses um, my children yes. um, because they're, they're going to go through their own journey like you and I have discussed. Exactly. And they're going to find their own place to get in time to get there but I really have a feeling God's going to use this these few these years of my life to really uh, influence uh, their their direction and destiny and I look forward to seeing that place absolutely because you're going to see that happen Amen. in their lives and they having surrender modeled yes. and I think for a lot of us we want to give our kids stuff mm -hmm. but what we need to model for them is surrender yeah. <laughs> and loving the Lord it's not the stuff right. and be as transparent as possible absolutely you know I, I see a lot of parents in my circles of friends that that are doing a lot to try to move their families along. And, yeah. and uh, I think one of the biggest things Courtney and I have tried to live out now is just transparency. Just Amen. be broken before your kids as well. That's right. And let them know, look, this ain't an easy journey of faith. You know, it requires that we really take s some options that we can't see, you know, where, where but, but that's God. Yeah. And, and that's obedience and faith. And, it is. And, um, but when you choose it, um, Wow, the, the ride is just absolutely yeah. amazing. There's nothing like it. Thank There's you for coming like and for Thanks sharing for your story me. today. It's yes, been a blessing. The book is called Fulfilled, and we'll put all of that information up on our website as well. Thanks for joining, joining us. We've got to go, but we say goodbye, and God bless you. If you would like to purchase a copy of today's show for $15, you can send a check to the address on your screen or call us at 615-754-0039 be sure to mention the program number on the screen. If you would like to contact WHTN, you can write to the address on the screen or call us at 615-754-0039 or visit us on the web at www.ctntv.org. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Monica Speaks TV today. Thanks for watching Bridges. 